Good afternoon, members of Parliament, support staff, visitors in the public tribune, radio listeners, TV viewers, social media viewers, and members of the media. Welcome to the Central Committee meeting number 32 of today, Wednesday, June 8, 2022. We've established a quorum of eight members. Please let's stand for a moment of silence. I've received notice of absence from MP William Marlin and MP Sihat Bijlani and a notice of lateness from MP Sarah Westcott Williams. Is there any member of parliament that wish to have the floor for notification? MP Rumu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. A pleasant good afternoon to you and of course to my colleagues, the viewing and listening public and everyone that is tuned in all around the world. Today, I just want to join early in our first meeting. Uh, we had congratulatory messages going out to young St. Martiners who are excelling abroad. And uh, this is not new news, as we would say, but it's news that I think that needs to be shared. And I really, really, um, I, I get goosebumps when I'm talking about this because it really shows that St. Martiners are making their mark in the world. And I would like to say congratulations today to the family and friends of Ms. Kaisha Lawrence. Kaisha is a St. Martin born young lady who has been in America for a while um, going to school and uh, completed her college degree. She's now going on to do medical school and has been accepted in the Harvard Medical School. So Kaisha would be the first St. Martina to actually attend Harvard in um, you know, uh, studying medicine. And it's really, really a great, great feat for St. Martin. This young lady is the definition of a uh, you know, powerful um, young person who goes for what she believes in and has such a strong mindset. And every time she comes to St. Martin, she tries to give of herself to the community of St. Martin in trying to encourage young people to aspire and to believe in themselves and to garner the knowledge and education they need to be able to pursue their dreams and aspirations. So I wanted to say congratulations to, I call her mom, uh, Ms. Fleming, Ms. Mercedes Fleming, her aunts, Tamara and Tamilia, of uh, Tamara's of T's Closet and just say congratulations because this shows that it really um, gives a lot of meaning to family in the village raising a child. And Kaisha being one of us uh, from St. Martin, being able to go to Harvard and to study medicine, I think is something great and a great achievement for St. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Rumu. Is there any other member of parliament that wish to have the floor for notifications? I see no need. Then we move, we have then for this meeting the following agenda points. Proposal by Party for Progress on Parliamentary, Parliamentary Relationship Development registered under IS 026 Parliamentary Year 2021-2022 and also IS 092 Parliamentary Year 2021-2022, both dated October 5th, 2021. Before we go over to the agenda point, it is important to note that this meeting originally had two agenda points. However, the document regarding the revision of the rules of order still needs to be finalized and was removed from the agenda for that reason. So we'll then go over to this agenda point. Yes, MP. Madam Chair, just be because that point came up, um, being that we're saying it's being worked on, is there a new document that members of parliament can probably expect with regards to this, this uh, the rules of order draft? So it has been changed since last discussion, faction leaders? Um, I was just discussing with the secretary general, the advice he has, it hasn't been changed, but it still have to go into advice to be presented. So it's still being worked on that, but not that any changes has been made to okay. it. Okay, thank yes? you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, so yes, so this agenda point. On September 17, 2021, Parliament received a proposal by MP Gums 
And this document, again, stated before, registered under IS-026. And um, on October 5th, 2022, Parliament received a letter from MP Gums, MP Peterson, MP Westcott-Williams. Oh, yes, September 17, 2021. Yes, it was a long time back. Then on October 5th, 2021, because we forgot to make that change there, <laughs> Parliament received a letter from MP Gums, MP Peterson, MP Westcott-Williams, and, and then MP Bunkamper with the request that a central committee meeting be convened to handle the proposal submitted by MP Gums on behalf of the Party for Progress um, faction. This document is registered under parliamentary, uh, under parliament, at Parliament under the P drive on, under IS 992092. The proposal reads as follows. The proposal is to rescind or end the Parliament of St. Martin's membership to Parlatino and redirect the membership fee and travel resources into initiatives that drive deeper cooperative um, ties between the three Caribbean countries of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and with our immediate neighbors in the Northern Caribbean. Before continuing, I'd like to add the following. In the meeting, in the meantime, the Secretary General of Parliament, on the basis of the proposal, had reached out to, for instance, the Territorial Council of the French, French side, French St. Martin, and the House of Assembly of Anguilla, and both indicated interest in intensifying the relationships in the people's representation, which is the Parliament on the parliamentary level. It is also important to note that during the last held tripartite meeting between Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, delegations agreed that the amount of tripartite meeting should be intensified. During this meeting, the proposal of the PFP was also mentioned. Information was also sought out regarding membership of the Parliament of the Parliamentary Bodies of CARIBCOM and OECS. It is important to know that St. Martin is currently not a member of CARICOM or OECS. However, in the case of CARICOM, once the country St. Martin becomes an associate member, the parliament can become a member of the parliamentary body of CARICOM. All members have received all documentations related to this agenda point and via the email and can be found on the P drive of parliament. We now go over to the deliberation on the proposal. At this time, I'd like to first give the floor to uh, the requester of this meeting, MP Melissa Gums. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good afternoon to you, to my colleagues, to the Kefir, and to those joining us online or via radio or any other medium. Uh, Madam Chair, as you mentioned, this meeting is indeed regarding a proposal that the PFP faction submitted uh, last year uh, regarding two areas related to Parliament's relationship development initiatives. Uh, firstly, as you mentioned, the withdrawal of St. Martin's membership from Parlatino, the Latin American Parliament, an organization which we've been a member of since 2010, but from which we've seen little in the way of tangible returns on investment. This is the reality, despite a $30,000 annual membership fee and a travel budget, budget that's now at half a million guilders, or a little over $277,000. Secondly, the proposal discusses the opportunities that exist for the Parliament of St. Martin regarding relationship development with our closest neighbors, including Anguilla, St. Kitts and Nevis, and of course, the French side. That section also speaks about increasing our engagement, as you mentioned, with our kingdom partners in Aruba and Curaçao, as well as improving relations with our nearest kingdom neighbors, St. Eustatius and Sabre. The motivation behind this is that it shouldn't only be that in a time of crisis or need, we call on our neighbors. That is a recipe for failure in any relationship. This includes encouraging and monitoring government's initiatives to join CARICOM and the OECS in whatever membership capacity is possible for us, but as well outside of those organizations through parliament-driven initiatives to engage with Anguilla, St. Kitts, the BVI, St. Bats, particularly when it comes to our shared issues of access challenges related to airlift or ferry service, and perhaps most importantly, climate change and food security. I want to say for the record, Madam Chair, that this proposal uh, to terminate that membership did not materialize out of thin air or even out of a disdain for networking, which is the main activity I've been told Parlatino is good for. Originally, it has come from the very public that we've been elected to serve because they are not seeing the return on investment that their tax guilders has gone to. 
We share the public's primary concern as a faction, Madam Chair, on the total spend on travel for Port Latino and the return on investment for country St. Martin of that spend, hence the proposal. Nevertheless, it was expressed to me that there was some discomfort with the proposal as it was submitted with the two previously mentioned components and that it would probably fail if it were brought to a vote. And indeed, we realize that making a decision without objective, tangible data to back said decision is a poor exercise. The reality is that there has been no actual objective, fiscally responsible assessment of what do we get out of this, especially considering the urgency with which the Palatino membership has been defended and justified, despite there being no tangible results that have come from it since the dawn of our membership. And actually, to remind the public, the Netherlands Antilles Parliament was a member of Palatino. Our rollover invitation to join was received after we became a country in 2010. So we can go back to even pre-2010 to see actually has anything come of this. So we've come today with an amendment to the original proposal, Madam Chair. The amendment would first retract the first component of the original proposal, which was to immediately terminate the Parliament's membership to Parlatino. And it proposes that the Secretariat of Parliament collects all relevant reports, initiatives, and outcomes in the archives of Parliament from 2010 to present date that are directly related to Parlatino and its committees, including Junta Directivo, as well as all relevant invoices and receipts related to the annual spend of each year of membership and attendance. And after that, that the SOAB be requested and commissioned via the Minister of Finance to execute an independent cost analysis on the contents of the information packet and determines the return on investment for Parliament and does country St. Martin's investment using the metrics as mentioned here on the floor of Parliament and in the media, which are initiatives emerging by, via Parlatino and country development emerging from Parlatino. This analysis would then provide all members of Parliament with an independent, objective, data-driven foundation on which we can decide as to whether this is the relationship we should continue or not, especially when we consider the importance of responsible financial management and spending that all levels of public service should be focused on. And finally, the amendment proposes that in keeping with the second component of the original proposal, to engage in relationship development with St. Martin's immediate and Eastern Caribbean neighbors, that the Presidium of Parliament organizes before the end of 2022 meetings between the Parliament of St. Martin and our counterparts on Sabre and St. Justatius, as well as the Collectivité de Saint Martin and Anguilla, with the purpose of, firstly, establishing relations, and secondly, hosting familiarization discussions regarding connectivity between our territories, impact and localized solutions to um, climate in our territories, and food security in the ongoing pandemic scenario. This amendment is going to be sent and should be booked in, and I've also printed some copies, Madam Chair, um, and I would request a reading pause if any members would require it. Madam Chair, it's our hope that this amendment to our original proposal provides a way forward for honest and objective reflection on the relationship that this parliament builds, particularly in the current geopolitical climate, and I look forward to the discussion and feedback. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. You're going to be sharing the... Yes? So then I will just take uh, MP, MP Bryson. Um, since we're going to take a reading pause, there's one thing that is relevant to this discussion that maybe we can collect during that reading pause. We need to give the members of Parliament and the public a proper breakdown on the travel budget of Parliament. The impression that the entire travel budget of Parliament goes to Parlatino is not correct. We go to IPCO, we go to flag this, etc. So I think let us provide that breakdown as well for the edification of the entire public. This is Palatino, this is IPCO, this is the Flag Days, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, MP Bryson. MP Gums? Just to clarify, Madam Chair, I didn't say that our entire travel budget was, par was that. It, it, that's literally just our Palatino travel budget. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. Both your requests have been noted, and I will now take a, do you think 20 minutes which should be fine, should suffice? I'll take a 20-minute um, break to, uh, provide everyone with the information and to follow up on the requests posed by MP Bryson. Meeting adjourned for 20 minutes.
Welcome back, members of parliament. We just took a 20-minute adjournment to give the, pre the members of parliament the opportunity, MP, thank you, <laughs> the opportunity to read the amended proposal by uh, PFP, Party for Progress, his proposal. And I would now to, like to now turn the floor over to MP Bryson. No. MP Bryson, if he would like to, to have the floor. MP Bryson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, pulling up my documentation. Bear with me. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to actually thank the... PFP and the, the leader's proposal and her elucidation today um, on the reasoning behind this, uh, this, this proposal that was there. Um, very pleased to see that, you know, a, a sort of an, a sort of a gauge was done, it appears, to kind of, let's say, a litmus test of how far the parliament was willing to go and some adjustments are made. I think that's very uh, commendable on the part of the faction to have taken some of the informal uh, feedback that's been given over the time since this proposal was received. Um, we've received some adjustments. I want to just start maybe with the, the easy part, with my feedback on the third point in the amended proposal that was received. Um, I'm good with this. I think this is good. I think any proposal to add to our existing ability to secure more regional and international cooperation from a parliamentary level is great. Um, the only question I would have there is how do we handle that from a budgetary perspective? Is a, maybe would the, uh, does the faction believe a new separate budget is created uh, to cover, uh, I don't know, are we hosting, because hosting familiarization discussions regarding, so you're talking about hosting events, et cetera. I just want to know what the plan is budgetary wise, if there's any information on that. But for the rest of it, um, yeah, and that's more directed to the faction to provide their feedback. For the rest of that point three, I think it's excellent. Just want to have a better understanding of how they envision it from a budgetary perspective. Um, but on this issue of Parlatino, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the feedback received during the break uh, and a bit of a discussion. And I think it's important that we're very open and clear about what the travel budget is of Parliament, how it's broken down, how it's proposed. There are estimates made. Um, and, but then what is actually, because you have a budget, but I think some perspective needs to be given on what is ultimately spent. Because from since 2017, at least from my own, let's say, mental assessment on what actually took place since I have been a member of parliament, I'm willing to bet that we have never uh, gone anywhere, gotten anywhere close to spending the entire budget of Parlatino, which might tell me that maybe there's room for adjustment, maybe a closer look of what is actually being spent on Parlatino is something that will be helpful. And I don't think, I'll get to the point of SOAB in uh, a little later, but I don't think maybe that's something you need SOAB for. I think the secretariat, especially the staff that's very experienced in booking travel and so on, is, is able to kind of give us some recommendations on how we can further save and make a more efficient use of the cost for Palatino. Um, further to that, Madam Chair, discussions have been had about the fact that one of the major factors that raise the cost of all travel of the parliament, whether it's for Flag Day, for IPCO, et cetera, is actually the fact that we tend to book very late. Um, you know, our procedures for edification of the public is that any travel from official members of parliament must come to a central committee meeting. Once the central committee approves, only after that point, the secretariat can do their part in booking the travel, and the travel agent does not book your ticket until they receive their money, which means that the process then has to still go to the finance ministry, the payments have to go to the travel agent, and only when they receive it, they will actually book the ticket. And this is highly inefficient. And I think another aspect that needs to be looked at is the parliament finding a way, I know it's challenging, but finding a way to have our own credit card to be able to book your own tickets. Not anything against uh, the travel agent, even the travel agent can be paid by credit card but it's just the time frame of booking tickets sometimes two days before you leave. You're asking to pay two to three times the amount you normally would if you properly plan and make payments via credit card. I say all this to say that I don't think there's an either or situation. Um, we spoke earlier today of some of the merits and importances of Parlatino as, as, a, as an, uh, a, a, a body. Um, I don't think it's all about networking. I think networking is very significant. But I can give tangible examples, at least for myself, 
that have had results and impacted St. Martin to this day. Um, Madam Chair, I'll give the example that I gave earlier, but go a little more detail. We had a piece of legislation that came to this parliament, which was the, it was related to the different FATF laws that had to come here. And the Minister of Justice at the time brought this law that was going to define in our legislation what a terrorist is and also give a clear definition on what a politically exposed person is. Now, I was a new legislator at the time, I'm not a lawyer, and I needed advice on how to go about that. And at the time, um, speaking to the Khrifi at the time, she said, you know, she recalled that Palatino actually had passed a model law on this very topic, and being that uh, it, it is something that has already passed, maybe I can use that as a reference point to see what is a piece of legislation or what's a better way to do it. Why was this important? Because the legislation before us that this parliament was told approve or you're gonna get blacklisted had a terrorist defined as, uh, to, to kind of paraphrase, you know, a violent, a group of violent uh, uh, organization and so on. And even in the questions I asked, okay, what happens if there's a group of people that get in a fight? You know, are they to be defined? The definition was very weak. Parlatino used in their research what fits for our regional culture and, and norms a definition that differs slightly maybe from other international organizations, but one that I think fit um, what we do and actually was ultimately passed by the Parliament of Simatin. But even in addition to that, the definition of politically exposed person, all of us in here know what um, financial difficulties are put upon us because we are politically exp uh, exposed persons. But the definition at the time was we had estimated would result in anywhere between 80% to 90% of the entire population being labeled as a PEP. Now sure, could I have gone to other definitions or other maybe just Google a, a better definition of PEP? But the Parlatino was able to directly communicate with me. I was able to get with the, the, the presenter of the law. The Secretary General of the Parlatino weighed in as well on the importance and what due diligence they did in defining this PEP. And ultimately today in St. Martin, the reason why we have been able to box in what the definition of a PEP is and to prevent a situation where everyone in St. Martin has a hard time getting a bank account and has to do all these different things or has to go through all kinds of additional screening just to have financial management in their own country, well, Palatino helped. Now, Madam Chair, if I have to ask any auditing company, what is the financial or the return on investment on something like that for St. Martin? I see that as an impossible task. I don't think you could put a number on what I just described, and there are other examples. My bank law was also based on a Palatino law. The, I also had used the Internet Quality Standard Act to meet with, uh, have a work visit with the telecommunication companies to see if they are coming with an uh, 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 Internet standard in the country. What is the value of all of this? I question the ability of an auditor to be able to quantify that in dollars and cents. And that is my concern with the part of SORB being commissioned to quote using the return metrics as mentioned by members of parliament in the media and on the floor of parliament, which are initiatives emerging from Parlatino and development of and partnerships emerging from Parlatino. Again, another example, we had the opportunity for our chair lady and another member of parliament to be on a panel and that resulted from Palatino to have high level discussions on an international level and to be well represented in the country. Again, how do we quantify something like that? I, I, I really would wonder how that would happen. I do think it is good to put together a better financial picture of what Palatino is from a cost perspective. So my proposal would rather be to actually have the secretariat execute a cost analysis I think that part is good. Let's go back, let's say five years, or if you want to go back to the inception of parliament as well. Um, but really figure out what these costs have actually been. So not budgeted costs, but what has the parliament spent year after year? Um, what is the average cost per MP, et cetera? I do agree with that part, but I don't think, um, you know, I need an outside entity. I think we have the information here. It's probably as easy as Kelly running to his computer and hitting print and getting a lot of that information for us, I would want to start there first um, before going as far as auditing. Let's do it internally. The Secretariat presents a cost analysis on the contents of the information packet. Um, 
Well, let me rephrase that. I, would, I don't know what the information packet means. I just mean a cost analysis of Pi Latino. That's, that's really basically what I am for, the SORB and all of that other stuff. I, I question the validity of that. Madam Chair, every tool given to a member of parliament, it's up to us to make use of it. You have made, I think, very good use, Madam Chair, of Pi Latino. You have made some great links with Argentina. You are part of the Junta Directiva. We have other meta, other, um, it, it connected you to another high level discussions then in Argentina. We have a, a, a seasoned educator that is now in the, in the big stage of education. And I am not going to quantify that for you, Madam Chair, or for the MP, or for anyone else that has been able to excel on behalf of this country as a result of what they got out of Palatino. I know what Parlatino does for me to serve my people. I know what it does. There are over 109 model laws, and I challenge anyone to show me any pan-Latin or pan-Caribbean organization that provides that level of resource to any parliament in this region. I would love to know. I would love to know if the CARICOM has such a, a even day, have a pan-Caribbean legislative library available to parliamentarians. I would, I, that, that is something, maybe it's there, but I don't know. This is the only thing I was able to find. Even the Eurolat, which I do think, that is an organization we should be a part of. The Eurolat fits very well with what we do. We are a constituent state within the Dutch kingdom that is part of Europe. What better international organization that connects us with Europe and our region? Eurolat. So I would like to propose, let us also explore membership of Eurolat. Now we're talking. Look, regional is great, but having pan-regional is even better because now you have your European counterparts and your Latin American and Caribbean counterparts in one room. And let's figure out the differences from a cultural, political, and geographical perspective. So I think um, in addition to the cost analysis of this, I think the Secretariat should get some information to the, to the Central Committee about what it would cost for us to be a member of Eurolat, um, what, it would, uh, what would be a prognosis, annual membership fees, how often are meetings there, maybe give us an idea of that, because that's a very valuable body that I believe also you, Chair Lady, had, had, some, had some interactions with them, and I think it's great. Again, where did the interactions with Eurolat begin? At Par Latino. Copal. Copal is another organization where we, via Par Latino, have been able to interact with them. And what did the Copal do? The Copal was the only international organization that wrote a written statement in defense of Aruba St. Martin in Curacao for the wrong treatment we were getting from State Secretary Knops and the Netherlands. And how did we reach Copal? We're not a member of Copal. But how did we reach them? Pa Latino stepped in and said, Copal, you need to see this. You need to see what's going on. And Google the statement that came out to Copal and the, and the response that the, the, the Reichs Ministerat or the, the Kingdom government had to give because Copal put them on notice. I could go on and on about the merits of these type of things, but if you yourself don't go, if you yourself don't use a tool, if you yourself don't give it a chance, I am willing to give a chance to all the proposals here. CARICOM, Sematin, Anguilla, Sabre, Stacia, Friendside. I'm open to that. But why close the door on something that you haven't even given a shot to? I think every single member of parliament should go to Palatino once for themselves and understand for yourself what it is to be a parliamentarian on the big stage. We take for granted our role in here. But over there, we know what it is to really be shoulder to shoulder with the biggest and most powerful countries in the world. Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Panama, Cuba, Dominican Republic. Those are not no PR, PR countries. These are some serious countries that are on our side. So, Madam Chair, I think this whole discussion is, is, again, commendable that the PFP faction has amended their original position. I am okay with that part, with most of this proposal. 
I believe we should start to summarize before going to SOAB, allow the secretariat to do their work and do the information that is within them and do an internal cost analysis before bringing out the outsider because I'm sorry, it might not be the intention, but it comes across to me like we need an outsider to tell us what's going on with our finances in here. And I don't want to cast that shadow on the secretariat. The secretariat has the information. They can provide it to us. And if we need a deeper interpretation of that, then maybe we go general audit chamber, we can go to SOAB or whatever. But let's start with getting the information first because I don't have the information in front of me. All I have is my memory of the Aryan motion in 2017 that had halted Palatino, that in the only half of 2018 we traveled to Palatino, only half of 2019 we traveled to Palatino towards the end of that year because the Aryan motion was extended, let's say, as an agreement, an understanding that we would extend it. End of 2019 and early 2020, we started to travel. We had a pandemic. 2021, we didn't travel. So the impression that it was six years of 500,000, and that means 3 million has been spent on Palatino is simply not true. So let's get to the bottom of what has actually been spent since 2017. Since 2017, that, I would say that would be a good metric, five years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. And to elucidate a little bit on what you um, requested, in general, our travel budget, the composition of our travel budget includes Parlatino, it includes IPCO, it includes special dele delegates participating at the first and second chamber for any kingdom laws that is proposed. It also includes the national holidays. It includes the contact plan between Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin and Suriname. And it also includes uh, the chair lady or the chairperson to travel when, it, when they receive, when I receive direct invites, we also have a budget for that. Now, when it comes to Parlatino and the reason Parlatino is so extensive it's because we have about 11 committees in Parlatino, and um, a meeting is called twice a year, two meetings per committee. That means there's 22 meetings a year, and that means we have two members per committee traveling. That's 44 travels. We don't do it all the time. We have so many times um, we skip uh, meetings that we don't attend, but that is mainly the reason it is that extensive. But again, um, to confirm, MP Bryson, what you just mentioned, I, um, Parliament, we, 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 I think we missed a few meetings recently. So it, it, that happens on and on as well. So, um, and also to confirm, MP Bryson, Parlatino, um, our Eurolat is already par a part of Parlatino. Um, Eurolat is, um, so we are part of Eurolat via Parlatino, correct. <laughs> you saw him saying it. <laughs> And yes, um, and that meeting is also twice a year, also attended by the, the chairperson. So I hope I've clarified that. Um, some of your questions are, yes, MP Bryson? Just one other point I forgot to mention in my notes to give another additional perspective. The fact that uh, many of the meetings take place in Panama, and uh, generally we have direct flights to Panama. The average ticket round trip, first class, as per the Bazal de King's Reichling, I mean the travel Reichling, is $620, you can go on kayak.com and see for yourself. And the average first class round trip ticket to go to the Netherlands for IPCO is 5,000 euros. Just to give some perspective. So are we going to look at IPCO as well eventually? Maybe we should. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Next on the speakers list, we have MP Angelique Remout. You have the floor. Thank you once again. Pleasant good afternoon once again, uh, Madam Chair Lady. I would just like to give um, my experience being a first time a rookie, basically, attending uh, Parlatino this year. And what I would like to say, Madam Chair Lady, is that Parlatino opened up my eyes as to the benefits and the very important role St. Martin plays as a partner in the Parlatino Parliament. I believe that. Uh, the reason why persons may have had a not so good impression of Parlatino would have been accountability. And I believe in everything that we do, we have to be accountable because indeed um, it's our money as well because we're also taxpayers. So when we say taxpayers money, we have to include that we're also paying taxes. But because of that, we should be accountable to the persons who have elected us to office. So I think over the years we have heard or we haven't heard enough about the advantages and how Parlatino has been beneficial for St. Martin. 
So I believe that if Par Latinos utilize correctly, we could, we could create vast opportunities for St. Martin in numerous areas. Forging partnerships with numerous Latin and other countries for sustainable developments in the 21st century, which would be very advent advantageous for St. Martin's development and utilizing and amending the numerous laws that have been passed over the years that pertain to issues that we are faced with in St. Martin that can benefit the people of St. Martin is one of the, uh, is one of, of the two areas that I see that can um, benefit St. Martin once Par Latino is utilized in the right way. Numerous laws have been passed at Par Latino and in my trip, I identified a couple laws that actually piqued my interest. Um, but being an advocate for equitable education for all, I place my focus on those that pertain to education. For example, the model law to guarantee the human right to access to information and communication technologies and the internet and eliminate the digital divide which is one of the laws that I can see assisting all school-going children who may not have access to internet and also do not have the necessary tools or skills to thrive in this era of technology is one of the laws that I feel that we as parliament, as the committee also for Parlatino, um, we can look at and see how we could amend it to benefit us here in St. Martin. The other law deals with the special needs for inclusive education with an emphasis on the people with specific educational support needs, an area of major concern for me, because not only did I campaign on this, but I have also been championing this since the inception of my tenure here as a member of parliament. The Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports have been to parliament on my request to provide answers to the many questions surrounding this issue and is currently tasked with providing Parliament with a policy that focuses on special needs education. I have also had meetings with key stakeholders as it pertains to getting the St. Martin Vocational Training School validated and accredited. And I see where this model law and the many position papers which have been done over the years on special needs and vocational, um, vocational education and institutions for behavioral modification as providing more light at the end of the tunnel to have a concrete law that benefits all students who fit into either one of these groups. As it pertains to the possibilities of forming partnerships, after one of the Par Latino meetings which I attended, um, where I explained my role as a chair lady of, of the Committee of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, I was invited by the deputy director of the University of Austria in Argentina to be a speaker on the panel of education and parliaments. This was the first ever international workshop of scholars and parliamentarians held in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this concept started some 17 years ago in the UK. This international workshop of scholars and parliamentarians brought together the two groups to discuss research findings, which are of practical use to parliamentarians. The panel sessions provided an opportunity for the presentations and discussions of the various findings and assisted parliaments to evaluate and make suggestions for improvements in our own current systems. As a speaker on this panel for parliaments and education, I focused on education in the 21st century and the need for global change to meet the needs of all children with a focus on individualism, seeing that even though times has changed, not much has changed in our educational systems, and that parliaments all over the world could have a major impact on creating the much needed diversification in education. My one week stay in Argentina for the International Workshop of Scholars and Parliamentarians was not only one of exchange, but it was one where I gained much knowledge and was also based on the various meetings we attended, uh, was invited, to become a member of four different organizations. One organization called UNITE, which is a global network of more than 215, um, which has currently more than 215 parliamentarians in 80 countries advocating for more effective global health policies and the end of infectious di diseases. 
I was also invited to join the UNDP and Parliamentarians for Global Action. And last but not least, and this invitation came about a month ago, I was also invited to become a professor for the fall program at the University of Austria in Argentina, providing an online course. So to say that Par Latino is something that should just be scrapped or that we should no longer be a part of it, I would not be one who would agree to this because I'm a new member and I believe that we can all attest to being a different parliament, one that works very hard and that is being and that is willing to be held accountable for our actions and could, could provide proof on all that we do and how we do it. So I would just wanted to share that with um, my fellow parliamentarians and of course the viewing and listening public. And I could not emphasize more the tremendous benefits and opportunities that St. Martin, being a member of Par Latino's parliament has, but again, it is up to the individual parliamentarians to seize these opportunities and to make them work for the benefit of the people of St. Martin. I thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Ramu. I'd like to now give the floor over to MP Melissa Gums. Sorry, MP. MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, um, I've heard the comments of my colleagues so far. Um, and I think I, I really need to reiterate that it is about the money in general. It's not necessarily the amount, as MP Bryson said, but I too am still very interested in seeing the overall spend from since 2010 um, on Par Latino. Pity we don't have the, I, I would prefer 2010. That was the original proposal um, because we've been a member since then. And I think that to just base it on the metric of who's here, no, it's not gonna, we're not gonna be here forever. Um, so I think that's a good, um, starting point when you're trying to get an idea of how long something has been going on. In private sector, you usually do an assessment after five years, but assessment is a word that frightens us sometimes. Um, regarding the um, internet standard set uh, that MP Bryson mentioned, Madam Chair, I just want to clarify for the public that the setting of an internet standard is not something we have to go to Panama for. Um, BTP is supposed to do that by way of the Minister of Teat. Um, it would be good to get the minister's insight whenever he returns to work on what his vision for internet standard for Sim Martin uh, should be. And I additionally hear the uh, model laws and which exactly they are that model laws because Parlatino is not a legislative body um, in its, at its core. Um, we have examples of legislation that has been mentioned in the reports, because I read the reports from the two members that went, and I appreciate that they submitted trip reports. Um, we have examples of legislation that we can easily take and adapt from within the existing constitutional construct we are in right now. Um, from a cultural perspective, you have Aruba and Curacao, which, which we actually share more from a cultural perspective with than we do most of the Latin American uh, parliament members. Um, and I think that that should be the starting point and that should, that, that, that's a very weak defense then I think of maintaining this membership. And, and finally, Madam Chair, I all due respect, I don't really see what invitations received has to do with the discussion at hand, uh, particularly uh, because much of the information that I'm hearing mentioned in defense of it are essentially um, Googleable. We were to just create it. Yes, I just created that word. I'm trying to take over former MP Bon Campers um, role. So Madam Chair, for me, I, I reiterate again, I would prefer all due respect to the Secretariat, but we do not have, uh, uh, MP De Weaver maybe knows the word, but to do a more in-depth uh, financial overview, I guess a forensic um, insight into the spending, we can get the data, sure, but I think the analysis of it is something that should still be left to SOA Bay, so I would still prefer that that is left within the proposal and then carried over to a vote. And if it's something that my colleagues don't want, then Madam Chair, they should be able to publicly stay so as is their right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. Next on the speakers list, we have MP Solange. Ludmila, Dunk, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to my colleagues. It's a little far, sorry. Good afternoon to those tuned in. Uh, I am also going to thank the PFP and, and MP Gums for, for the proposal. Um, I am always one that uh, as well um, 
you know, I have a, I have a love for analyzing what our current reality is and how we can approve upon that reality. And we all will have different uh, perspectives, but the idea is that um, we dissect and look at better ways in which to to do our work. So for me, um, I think the amendment is is definitely appropriate. Uh, so I am one that that went to Parlatino to form my opinion on it. Uh, I saw value um, in the, the registration, um, not a registration, sorry, being a member of Parlatino. However, I do agree that indeed um, there needs to be some sort of, of audit of, of, of the cost. Uh, I think, and I agree with MP Bryson, that it might be uh, difficult to quantify what is value, but indeed I do agree that there needs to be some sort of, of audit of, of Parlatino and um, the benefits to the country because in it, it, we spend taxpayers' monies. Uh, accountability is extremely important. Uh, we see that we lack accountability across um, both, to me, the legislative and the executive branches. So we should never be afraid of um, assessing what is being spent and what we are doing and how whatever we are doing is bringing value to the people. So I agree. When I look at the rest of the original proposal, I was one in um, one who in September last year sent the Prime Minister questions on OEC OECS membership. Uh, this morning, the Prime Minister gave us some insight into what is happening in terms of requesting uh, CARICOM associate membership. Also, there was some uh, request that went out to the OECS for new missions uh, because I do believe that we have to strengthen regional ties. That argument, uh, that argument is, 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 is moot for me. So I am a proponent of not only eventually becoming associate members um, of both OECS, I prefer OECS, um, and CARICOM eventually, but also working together in the region as parliaments in order to support each other in our work for um, the people. I also agree in stronger kingdom ties, Right, especially in this, I would call it a volatile time in the kingdom. I always talk about redefining who we are as citizens in the kingdom. And if we're going to redefine who we are, we have to not only look at ourselves, but we have to look at our relationships with our sisters and brothers right next door in Saber and Stacia, across the waters in the ABC Islands. So that is extremely important to me, in addition to us looking at our family in the north. Again, a very important point. Um, I would even want to suggest that perhaps a petite committee be put in place on how we could move forward with some of the points in the proposal, especially when the last time a meeting was held here with the collectivity, um, I think it was 2015, SG? Um, that, is, that is quite a long time ago, and we need to look at where we are as one island, as one people, and have discussions uh, at political level. So that is something that I would love to see us um, not only engage, but set a sort of new structure in place, whether it's meetings twice a year with the coll collectivity, uh, once a year with our brothers and sisters in Saber and Stacia. I believe that we need to move forward on um, creating a, a real strong relationship in which we can not only talk, but make agreements. Make agreements on matters that affect our people on both sides. So for me, Madam Chair, um, I agree that there needs to be some sort of audit of, of, of Parlatino and its existence and the monies and what has come out of it over the last, it doesn't matter to me how long, um, but I also do agree that uh, membership to such an organization is valuable, but also to that we do indeed need to look at uh, how close our ties are within the region and within uh, the Dutch Caribbean as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Duncan. I see that MP Bryson would like to have the floor once more. MP Bryson. Madam Chair, uh, I was going to comment on, you know, 
kind of making a snide remark about a minister that's ill right now on the floor of parliament, but uh, let the people's conscience deal with that for themselves. But other than that, Madam Chair, again, I think um, I want to reiterate this part about the Secretariat. I think to be very clear about what the proposal should be, uh, I would like to hear from the Secretariat what the options would be once they present the information. They can, in, let's say, interact with the SOAB. I have even said, I've read some of the, um, I, I don't know if you call it like, uh, let's say, unsolicited uh, audits and quick scans that the General Audit Chamber has done. As a matter of fact, we have a committee in this parliament that interacts directly with the General Audit Chamber, and that is a con the, the committee of uh, country expenditures. This is a country expenditure. So that would be a good way to interact with the General Audit Chamber via that committee. I believe it's Article 18 or 23, or somewhere in there where um, they are able to do solicited and unsolicited audits for the government and the statin, so also for us. Um, so there you have a very clear legal path and a committee that can get involved in looking at those financial audits and so on. I want to recommend, again, that the Secretariat be the one to take the lead on providing this information and determining what the best entity should be for providing this audited information. And with, the, with an attention being placed on the value of having the Committee of Country Expenditures uh, um, look at it, as well as um, the General Audit Chamber. Uh, also, I was very happy to hear testimonials. This is important. You can only testify about something you see for yourself. I'm sure if we were having a discussion today about the value of IPCO and whether we should travel to go to IPCO, to go to Holland, to interact with our colleagues over there. I have been there, and I can say, yes, I see the value of it. But how do I sit down here today in a debate and talk about, yeah, it goes away some money. It's 5,000 euros round trip to go down there and this and that. How would I have such a debate if I never went? We heard testimonials from people that have been there, that have interacted with it, that have made use of the model laws. I have stated how I make use of it. If you don't like how I make use of laws to do my job, I want to use the, the Palatino model laws. So yeah, that's my right. And I know that it has translated in the benefit of this country. We have other members of parliament said the same. And I think it's very strange that the proposal is based on not even being able to evaluate it yourself. So again, it's very good that more of, of, of members of parliament have had this experience. I recall once, actually, we went to a, a meeting about infrastructure. And maybe uh, MP Brownville recalls this, where he, as chairman of the Committee of Romy, we were able, there was a lot of discussion in, in St. Martin about waste to energy, waste to energy. And one of the presentations of Palatino was exactly about that, but more from a legislative and policy perspective. Fits perfectly with the competencies of Parliament, and I believe at the time a, a committee meeting was called on that, and we got some very good information, not pitches from people who want to do waste to energy, but actually a presentation on what your structure should be, your legislative challenges, and so on. So more and more of those testimonials can come in from those who have been there to live it for themselves. Um, based on that, it further um, my position that Palatino, we should continue our membership. We should uh, do the proposal as is. From a technical perspective, Madam Chair, I don't know how we're going to handle that. Is it that the faction can choose to take my uh, proposal into account, or is this now a separate proposal? I don't know how, how we would manage that, or maybe I can hear some feedback from the presenters if they are willing to incorporate my proposal, which is just a very slight adjustment to point B, doing it via the Secretariat, rather than us assuming right away that the SOAB is the best entity. I don't know if we can hear from them on that aspect. And I did also didn't get a question, uh, answer to understand, I didn't quite understand part B about the hosting of familiarization discussions. Uh, is this like we're doing conferences and bringing people from around, if they, they can explain to me how they envision that from a budgetary perspective. Uh, those are the two things I would like the opportunity, if possible, Madam Chair, to, from the faction that presented the proposal. Thank you, MP Bryson. MP Peterson, I know you would like to have the floor, but before I do, I'll, I'll give MP Gums the floor to respond to MP Bryson. Madam Chair, right? I just want to clarify that, because um, uh, one of MP Bryson's questions were actually answered in a faction leaders meeting by the SG regarding the budgetary impact of regional development uh, with, for the relationships. So I'm not sure if I can share that information on the floor of parliament or?
the MP, MP, MP comes. <laughs> The intention of that meeting, the intention there, what we spoke about was to take it up into the budget 2023. Yeah. Um, um, I think we should just leave it at that. Yes. And then the other answer, maybe you can reply. Okay, if you could remind me of what the first, sorry. The, the question is, is that I've, I've proposed a slight amendment to part yes. B of point two. Uh, I, I consider it slight, where let's say you were to remove the SORB be requested, et cetera, et cetera, and instead put the secretariat, uh, so remove via Minister of Finance, et cetera, allow the Secretariat to do their determination on what the best way would be to do that audit, because then that opens the opportunity, like I mentioned earlier, for example, maybe the General Audit Chamber and the Committee of Parliament of Country Expenditures, maybe that's the vehicle to really delve into it. Then there's a bit of a parliamentary participation in it. So I just want to know if you're open to adjusting that part. Thank you, MP Bryson. Thank MP you, MP Bryson, comes. for the clarification. Madam Chair, um, as is the right of any MP, I've consulted with Secretariat before drafting this proposal, and this is the road that was identified with SOA Bay. So I just, mm -hmm. uh, through also my discussions with individuals from those entities as well, this is the road that the faction has chosen, and I would like the proposal to remain as is. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. Then I will then turn the floor now over to MP Rayan Peterson for your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. A good afternoon to my colleagues, to the Secretariat, and everybody else tuned in throughout the various media outlets. Madam Chair, I personally am not a part of the Palatino Committee, as I see that this is a wrong priority for the country of St. Martin. I think I've been public about this already. Um, the last Palatino, for example, I am still waiting to see the results of, you know, real results instead of personal benefits for individual members of Parliament. Um, as was said, this whole proposal, it's about the money in general and not the specific amount that is allocated to the, to the budget for Palatino at the moment. Even if we are using half of the budget allocated, let's say 200,000 guilders a year, that would come up to what within the last 10 years? Maybe one and a half, two million guilders? So reference to a piece of legislation in which the definition of a word can maybe now become debatable, to my personal opinion, is not something that we, on the long term, had to pay more than a couple of million guilders for. Model laws for Palatino can be found on the Palatino website. So to me, it's pretty clear as to how little the result has been from us being a member of Palatino. The impression that an MP wants to create that an auditor cannot do that assessment is a misconception. Because what this assessment is about is simple. Put the financials in front of the public and show the public how much we have actually spent over the last 12 years. And next to that, let's put all, all of the tangible results, including all of these small wins, like for example, the definition of a word, and see if that measures up to the amount of money that we chose to spend every year. Let the people decide, but bring forward the numbers. And on top of that, to compare IPCO, something that we are an integral part of, as St. Martin, but also as part of the kingdom, to Parlatino, also doesn't really make sense to me. As an MP in a Dutch kingdom, I wouldn't make such a statement. Like MP Duncan rightfully said, our relationships with the partners in the north and within the kingdom should be prioritized. And that fits actually right now into what we are currently doing with her committee. SRB is an auditor, and by law they can make this assessment for us. If SRB has already made it clear that they are willing to do this, then why not? The SRB is not an outsider, like was said. Actually, Article 3, Section 1, under E of the Loans for Ordering on the SOAB gives the Minister of Finance the ability to request this type of research. So then what information do we have to hide? Why don't we want our spendings the last couple of years to be scrutinized? The SOAB will automatically have to be in close contact with our Secretariat anyway to gather the information for them to do the assessment. So for me, it's pretty clear, Madam Chair, and I would definitely support the proposal as it is, because there is some heavily needed clarity on the country's spending, in this case being us as Parliament. And as for the audit chamber, I am still a proponent of the SOB to do this because they are a separate body. I am not one to assess and judge myself. I'd rather have an objective third party do that to avoid a biased conclusion. And to end off, just a disclaimer, I am not impressed by being a part of any clique of NPs coming from all these big countries because none of them in turn can know what's best for my country, St. Martin. Some of my colleagues have this, well, you had to be there to see it attitude, but I actually chose not to be there. I don't need to be on a big stage, and personally, to my opinion, Palatino is not even a big stage. I don't see the logic in that statement at all. I am here for my small island of St. Martin, so again, all of these big countries, pew pew or not, 
don't really concern me when it comes to St. Martin and, and my task as an MP representing this country. So until it can be proven to me why the money spent over these years is benefiting our people and not ourselves as MPs, it won't change. So, Madam Chair, um, I'll end it up by saying I'm all, all for accountability and transparency, and we as Parliament also need to be held accountable for our spendings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Peterson. Uh, I see that, um, yes, please, that word is just a little too much for me. Um, thank you for everyone's comment. Uh, if everyone agrees with the amended proposal and if there's no more comments, then MPs, then the advice will be drafted and yes, MP, yes, yes, MP Bryson. Just to get some clarification, um, no, I'm not in agreement in the proposal as is. Uh, is there opportunity to uh, add additional proposals in the public meeting? Yes. Yes, MP Bryson. Thank you. You'll be able to amend the proposal if you wish in the OV. Thank you very so much. So uh, again, then the the um, the advice will be drafted. Then what we stated here today and sent. Um, to the public meeting for further handling and ratification. And if we have to make any amendments there, we can make it there during the OV. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, then, we have come to the end of this meeting. I would like to thank everyone for their input, everyone for their participation, and I hereby close this meeting. Meeting closed.